Before we can go any deeper into the book of Romans, there is an issue and an item that I think we need to address in one special session. And I want to do that this morning because it's right before us in the verses that immediately precede chapters 6, 7, and 8 in Romans. And I will read verses 20 and 21 of chapter 5. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the time of worship in your presence. We thank you that you are here with us. And that when we <clears throat> come to you to approach you, we don't just receive part of you, it's you in your entirety, because you cannot be separated. And so today, <clears throat> you are in our midst, and we are in your presence. And there is as much of you here today as there is in the greatest cathedrals in the world. And you give us special attention because of what Christ has done for us, and we thank you for that. And Father, as I try to impart some of the truth that you have impacted my own heart with this week, I pray that you would do something that we can't do, and that is empower the Word, so that it will have a transforming, empowering impact on our hearts and minds. Father, we pray that the Word would go forth today, not in Word only, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And that's entirely in your hands, Father. And we realize that and we trust you. God, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> well, our thoughts today are going to center around these words. Even so, grace would reign. Even so, grace would reign. You see, <clears throat> often when we talk about the issue of grace, we are speaking just simply of divine favor or an attitude which God assumes towards us as his people. But grace is more than that. Boyce in his commentary says this, he comments that the fact that grace is pictured as reigning like a king tells us something about grace that we have not yet adequately considered. It tells us that grace is a power, and we tend to think of grace as an attitude, and of course it is that. We even define it that way. We call grace God's unmerited favor toward the undeserving. In fact, toward those who deserve the precise opposite. But grace is more than an attitude. It is also a power that reaches out to save those who apart from the power of grace would perish. This means that grace is more than an offer of help. It is even more than help itself. And to use the illustration of the two rival kingdoms, it would be possible to say that Grace is an invasion by a good and legitimate king of territory that has been usurped by another. The battle is not always visible because this is a matter of spirit, a matter of spiritual and not physical warfare, but the attack is every bit as massive and decisive as the invasion of the beaches of Normandy by the Allied forces at the turning point of the Second World War. The Allies drew their maximum combined might into that encounter, and they won the day in a similar manner. God has thrown his weight behind grace, and grace will triumph. Grace is more than simply divine favor. Grace is divine power. I'd like you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 
I'm reading some very familiar verses, but they are very, very applicable. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might lead me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You'll notice in verse 9 that grace and power are equivalent. They are exactly the same thing. The answer that Paul received to his prayer from the Lord for deliverance from a physical affliction was very, very, very powerful. My grace is sufficient, for power is perfected in weakness. Grace and power in this particular portion are synonymous. And then he says at the end of the verse, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So the power that he's speaking of here, the power of grace, is referred to as the power of Christ. <coughs> And we are told very clearly in scriptures what the power of Christ is. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, we read these words. And may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable on, unto his death. So the power of Christ is the power of resurrection life. And so the insufficiencies of life that we are confronted with when we run into difficulties are reversed through the presence of divine life within the heart of the believer. That's what grace is. Grace is the empowering, enabling presence of Christ himself within the heart of his people. And that would be, in my estimation, would be very, a very, very accurate description of grace. Now, you need to realize that in the book of Romans, these particular verses, when it talks about the reign of grace, are introducing chapters 6, 7, and 8. Because in chapters 6, 7, and 8, the Apostle Paul is going to describe the reign of grace. How we do not any longer have to live under the domination and dictation and control of the sin nature in us but rather we live under the domination and the dictation and the control of divine life which has been imparted to us in our salvation. And so when he talks about grace reigning through righteousness unto eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, those are the words that he uses to introduce what we need to know when it comes to our wrestling with the sin nature within us. And so they are very, very, very critical words. And that's why we're taking just a few moments today to concentrate on this whole issue. Now you will notice in 2 Corinthians, or, or in Romans, I should say, that the Apostle Paul says that grace not only reigns, but he says it reigns through righteousness. So this empowering presence of God within the heart of the believer will not be realized unless we understand what it means to have received the gift of righteousness. This is all bound together. 
You see, if we in and of ourselves feel that we are sufficient in any way, shape, or form to face life, we will not be empowered by the Spirit of God. Grace is realized in the life of the believer when they understand that all that they have is based on the worthiness of the Son of God and nothing of ourselves. That is a very difficult lesson for us to learn as God's people. I have been a Christian for 60 some years and I think I'm just a beginner in understanding what this means. You know, it's not an accident in 2 Corinthians that the Apostle Paul says that the power of God reaches its completion in his weakness. That is not a popular message. Not popular at all. John Piper says this, one of the reasons that biblical Christianity has to be so drastically distorted in order to sell it to the mass market is that the mass is that the mar market wants power to escape weakness in leisure. But Christianity offers power to endure weakness in love. And then he says verse 9 of this portion just doesn't just sell. It won't sell. The world doesn't want it. Jesus said in response to Paul's prayer, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. In weakness? What the market wants is escape from weakness, not power in weakness. But to meet that felt need in our market, the message must be distorted. And it often is, unfortunately. I say these words, having thought them out, and I'm not going to speak them lightly. If we as Christians feel that we are going to experience a manifestation of the power of God in its completeness, when everything is right, when we are wealthy, when we are healthy, when our families are all harmonious, and when there are no oppositions and no difficulties, if we believe that that is a manifestation of the blessing of God, we have believed the lie. The greatest manifestation of the power of God in the life of the believer is in adversity. And it is designed by God so that the tough times that we face are not accidental. They are put there, Paul says. He had a messenger of Satan. That's a satanic angel. It's a demon that came to buffet him. And the idea there is beating with closed fists. And he describes that as utter weakness and helplessness. He can't handle it. There's nothing he can do about it. It won't go away. He pleaded with God. God would not take it from him. Why? Paul is crystal clear on this. The reason he wouldn't take it from me is because he wanted to bless me with his power. He says, power is perfected. The word perfected means reach its desired end. Where does the power of God reach its desired end? The power of God reaches its desired end when you are facing a difficulty and the Holy Spirit enables you to walk through that. That's where the power of God is manifest. And that's grace. That's what Paul is saying. The grace of God is the power of God released in the heart of the believer in the deepest need. I have to reprimand myself often right now because I have been chafing at the bit over COVID-19. I think personally, and forgive me, this is my own personal opinion, I think personally some of the stuff we're doing is nonsense. But I need to submit to it in honor of the people who are governing. I don't agree with them, but I submit. And I'm chafing at the bit. 
I don't like it when we can't visit people. I don't like it when we can't invite people to church. I don't like it when I'm not able to sit down with you without a mask on, so I don't have to book through these fogged up glasses. I'm 76 years old. Change comes very, very slowly at my age. It's hard to do, and I have been complaining. But why is this happening to me? It's happening for one reason. God wants to reveal to me my weakness. And why does he do that? So that he can give me his strength. Power is perfected, not in healings, not in demonstrations of power, not in miracles. That is not the demonstration of the completeness of power. The completeness of power that is spoken of by the Apostle Paul is reached in our weakness, not in our strength. It's because God will not compete with our sufficiencies. He will not have them. That's why understanding righteousness is so important to live the Christian life. That's why Paul uses this to introduce chapters 6, 7, and 8 of Romans, which are chapters of triumph and victory. He does it because if we don't understand the gift of righteousness, we will never understand what I'm trying to say this morning. I am totally helpless and I am totally unworthy. I can bring nothing to God but myself, just the way I am. And he's happy with that. That's what he wants. He says in chapter 12, verse 9, 2 Corinthians, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And that weakness is insufficiency. Would be a good way to translate it. My sufficiency for your insufficiency. Power for weakness. Sufficiency for insufficiency. And then he goes on to describe that a little further. He uses four terms in verse 10 to speak about our weakness. He says, I'm content with weakness, and then he adds this, with, with insults. That's when people are making you and your faith look bad or ridiculing you because of what you believe or the way that you live. It's a ridiculing, a scoffing. That's a weakness. Distresses. That word distresses is reversals of fortunes. The unexpected and the unplanned reversals when things happen that we hadn't anticipated and everything changes on us. We lose a job. We wreck our vehicle. All of these unexpected things that might happen, that's part of the weakness. Persecutions, these are acts of exploitation. It's when we are being chased or pursued so that people can inflict harm on us. It is an aggressive persecution which Paul experienced. That's what the weakness is all about. And he uses another term, it's difficulties, that's narrowness of space. It speaks of internal pressure, internal stress. It has the whole idea of being weighed down. That's the weakness. Now notice what grace does. This empowering of the Spirit of God in the heart of man, the presence of God, the strengthening presence, enabling presence of the Spirit. Notice what it does. Notice what he says in the beginning of verse 9. He says, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness. Not something. Weakness. Abuse. Being used being kicked around, being treated like dirt, being refused, unexpected reversals where I lose everything I have. Paul says this, most gladly. Is he an idiot? <laughs> What's he saying? 
In fact, the most lively is an adverb, and it comes from a noun which means sweet. It's highly agreeable, not just acceptable, desirable. How can that be? Weakness, insufficiency, inadequacy, loss, pain, hurt, persecution, misunderstanding, reversible fortunes, sweet. Listen, people, grace takes the bitterness of life and turns it into a sweet portion. I was going to bring a coffee maker up here this morning to illustrate this, but I don't like, I like black coffee, but it's bitter. So I was going to brew a cup of coffee up here and just let it sit there and then I was going to take a taste of it and pucker up because that's what I do when I drink coffee that doesn't have any sweetener in it. And then I take a little spoon of sugar and I put it in that cup and I stir it around and it's palatable and becomes sweet. You see, that cup of black coffee with the bitter taste is the experiences of life. That's our weakness. Oh, incidentally, this weakness isn't sin. It has nothing to do with sin. It has to do with circumstance. That cup of coffee is my weakness. The grace of God is the sugar. When the sugar is mixed in that, it becomes sweet to the taste. I love coffee, but I don't like coffee without sugar. And then he says, I boast. Most gladly will I boast. Paul talked about boasting in Romans as well in Romans chapter 5, boasting in grace, boasting in his tribulation, glory, exalting, rejoicing. This is the same word here. It means the head is held up high. In other words, when we're being beaten and walked on and all these things are happening, the grace of God and the presence, the enabling presence of the Spirit of God in the heart of God's people enables them to walk with their head held high. Not looking at the ground and kicking at the gravel like my life is a mess and it's ended. No, no, no. And it doesn't matter what circumstance is involved. Because there is not a circumstance that touches your life or my life that is not either directly caused by God or permitted by God. Paul's was a messenger of Satan. It was a demon that was commissioned by God. I don't know how to handle that. But that's exactly what the portion teaches. And if you try and get anything other than that out of there, you miss it. The sovereign God is directing every circumstance, even the ones that torment. The idea there is a stick with a point on you and you're being jabbed with it. God governs even those on behalf of his people. And then there's another thing that happens. When we know and understand this grace, this enabling presence, this enabling power of the Spirit, he says in verse 10, Therefore I am well content, well content with weakness. Whew. The word actually means to think well of. Two words, to think and good. So he's saying then that because of this enabling grace which God imparts to me by his divine presence in me, because of that, even the worst of circumstances in my life are pleasingly acceptable. Even the worst that happens to me, I think it's good. 
Why? Because in my weakness, I know the power of Christ. In my weakness, I know the power of Christ. And it dwells in me, he says. That's pitching a tent over something and crawling inside and living there. That's the picture. When I am confronted with meek weakness, the power of Christ is manifest because at that point in time, he pitches a tent over me and he comes and he sits inside the tent with me. What a tremendous picture. You see, that's the message that we need to understand before we can move on in the book of Romans. Because if you don't see that, chapter 6 just becomes an intellectual pursuit of spiritual truth or something. And Paul never intended it to be that. He meant it to change your life and to change my life. He meant to teach us what it means for grace to reign and conquer sin. And if we don't understand the fact that it is all of God, and not of us, we will never be able to appreciate that. Well, there's so much more to be said. To many of us, this is Spurgeon saying this, there are many who are barely Christians. I like some of his statements because they make you stop and think. He says, there are many who are barely Christians. They have scarcely enough grace to float them into heaven. <laughs> And the keel of their vessel is grating on the gravel all the way. It's a miserable journey. If you don't understand grace and what I'm saying this morning, your journey is going to be laborsome. But if you understand grace, it's going to be sweet, it's going to be acceptable, and it's going to be well-pleasing. The author goes on to say there's too many of us are like the story of the poor European family who saved for years to buy tickets to sail to America. And once at sea, they carefully rationed the cheese and bread they had brought for the journey. Then after three days, one of the young boys that was with them complained to his father, and he said, I hate cheese sandwiches. If I don't, if I don't eat anything else before we get to America, to America I'm going to die. <laughs> and so, the father gave the boy his last nickel and he told him to go to the ship's galley and buy some, buy an ice cream cone. And when the boy returned, and it took him a long time, but when he returned a long time later with a wide smile, his worried dad asked, where were you? In the galley, he said, eating three ice cream cones and a steak dinner. <laughs> well, did a nickel buy all of that? No, no, he said, the food is free, comes with the ticket. <laughs> Probably heard that before. You know, we have the ticket, the food is free. It's called grace. Grace is the enabling presence of Christ himself within the heart that gives us sufficiency in place of our insufficiency. What a marvelous, marvelous grace. Let's pray. Father, this morning I want these words to encourage the hearts of your people. Father, I need to apologize to you for living like a pauper when I'm a son of the king. Father, just enable us to submit to you. Thank you for the weaknesses that you bless us with. And in the midst of that, teach us grace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.